we are going to be all over the place in Proverbs this morning, looking at the topic of humility. Humility. We were, uh, I was in a study with some men not too long ago, and uh, it was a wonderful study, and, and we were having a great conversation, and we were, we were talking about sin in our life, and because uh, we were going to have a time of prayer, and you know, some of the sins that had been, had been mentioned, not necessarily the, by these men that they were involved in, we, we had been talking about various sins that you could be involved in, and I said something to the effect, you know, um, you know, I, I, it's not, I'm not involved in one of those sins that we just talked about. But, you know, I do have a sin, and it's the sin of pride, and I really deal with pride. And I was really minimizing how bad this sin was in my life, or how bad this sin is. And so, without, <laughs> without saying a word, one of the gentlemen that was there just said, right, let me just read something for you guys. Oh, okay, go ahead. So he opens up Romans, and he reads this. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they don't not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Did you notice what was right in the middle of there? This particular version, ESV, uses haughty or boastful, but we can also insert prideful in there. So this sin that I was minimizing, God puts right smack dab in the middle of all these other sins. Sins that he hates. And if you wonder, does he really hate this sin of pride, of haughtiness, of boastfulness? Well, let's go to the Proverbs. And let's see what he says there. Proverbs 8.13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And then he goes on to say, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Then he goes on and Proverbs 6, 16, 17, first part of 17, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are, that are an abomination to him. And what does he say? Very, the very first sin that he lists there, haughty eyes. And you get this picture, right, of these haughty eyes, a prideful person sitting down, sitting on their perch of arrogance, looking down on others through their prideful eyes. But then, Solomon changes his gaze from upward to the heart, from the eyes rather, to the heart, where he says in Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So instead of love toward others, the proud person harbors judgment and bitterness. Instead of Instead of expressing kindness, they express disparagement. Now, I know that these are more extreme examples, maybe, but we all deal with pride in various forms, right? And some of us in the form that I just talked about. Humility, though, humility. I think pride is easy for us. Arrogance. But humility is hard. If not for all of us, most of us, right? Now, now you may be sitting there, some of you may be sitting there saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I am the most humble person in the world, right? If you are sitting there saying that to yourself, please listen to this sermon this morning. The rest of us who deal with pride, who deal, who struggle with humility, with, with being humble, I think one of the main reasons that is is that we struggle with significance. We all want to be significant, right? We all want to sense significance in our lives. We all want uh, to, to, to be significant maybe in the eyes of others, in the thoughts of others. And so that drives us, that need for significance drives us to do things, to say things that really come from a motive, of, 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 that come from arrogance, that come from pride. 
Because we want people to think certain things about us, to see us in certain ways. Humility is hard. And why is that? It's because of it's part of our human condition, right? It's a part of the fall. It's a part of, of us not understanding, truly, deeply understanding that we were created in the image of God. Every human being on the face of the planet is created in the image of God, but certainly because of the fall coming, that's broken. And, and we don't understand that, and so we start to search for significance. We start to so search for value in, in other things. And that leads us to the sin of pride and arrogance. Now, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we understand that our identity is in Christ. It should be in Christ, right? That is where we gain our value. That is who we, we gain our identity from. And so we shouldn't be in this search for significance because our, because our significance is found in Christ. But while we know this, right, we still do it. We still struggle with this search for significance. We still struggle with pride and arrogance in our lives, which means we struggle to be humble. Like I said last week, it's been estimated that people speak 860 million words in a lifetime. Now, I think that there are some people in here that hit that quota and be gone, Right? Now, there's some that don't get close to 860 million words. But no matter how many words you speak, whether it's close to 860 million or far less, I can promise you this. A lot of the words that we speak center around one person, me, myself, and I. Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to know? Lord, can you just show me at the end of my days, you know, I spoke this many words. Can you just tally how many times do I talk about myself? And it's going to be a lot. And maybe, maybe I'm projecting. Maybe I'm projecting because I know how I struggle with this, how I deal with it, how I have to continue to say, Todd, it's not about you. Stop. Stop bringing it back around to yourself. You're a pastor. You're supposed to be focused on other people. Come on. But it's so easy to focus on ourselves, isn't it? The antidote for this focusing on ourselves is humility, and it's an antidote that we have to take daily, multiple times a day. Proverbs says this, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22.4. Now we're going to look at that a couple of different times during the course of this sermon this morning. But again, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. What does that mean? What does it look like? I, I think we know that a humble person, just because a person is, doesn't, is humble, does not mean that they are going to be monetarily wealthy. It does not mean that they are going to receive the honor of the world. And it does not necessarily mean that they are going to live a, a, a long life or necessarily an easy life, all of those types of things. So what does it mean? We're going to look at that a little bit later. What does it mean that the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life? C.J. Mahaney defines humility this way. He says, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. Honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. If we start to do that, if we do that, we start to see the, the pettiness of the things we take pride in and are boastful about. Charles Spurgeon understood this clearly. He understood the foolishness of pride, of we especially, those of us who are followers of Jesus, to be proud and arrogant. He said uh, pride is a groundless thing, a brainless thing. He said it is the maddest thing that can exist. Why? Because we compare ourselves to one another and not to the ultimate example of perfection and goodness. I think Charles Spurgeon would say, listen, when you really understand your sinfulness and when you really understand God's holiness, his goodness, his righteousness, his perfection, all of those things, you will understand how mad it is to be arrogant and prideful about the foolishness, about the foolish things that we oftentimes are prideful about. Again, one more Mahaney quote. He wrote a book on humility, so it was a great resource. 
Pride takes innumerable forms but has only one end. Self-glorification. That's the motive and ultimate purpose of pride. To rob God of legitimate glory and to pursue self-glorification, contending for supremacy with him. The proud person seeks to glorify himself and not God, thereby attempting, in effect, to deprive God of something only he is worthy to receive. No wonder God opposes pride. No wonder he hates pride. Then he says, let that truth sink into your thinking. I think he's right on. Now, is there any role for pride? I, mean, I, I think if you do a job well, you can have pride in a job well done, right? You could be proud of, of your children, of, of those that do a good job. There, there's, I think, a, a, a good and healthy role for pride in our lives, but it's not pride in ourselves. It's not a self-boasting pride. The, when we do a job well done, I'm hoping that our attitude is, I'm very thankful for the giftings and ability that God has given to me to do this. May you be glorified. I am proud of this work of art that I just did. I am proud of the landscaping job that I just did. And any number of things. Fill in the blank there, right? For the reasons that we can be proud. But it's a, it's a pride that deflects thankfulness and gratitude to God for the giftings and abilities that he has given. So please don't hear me say there's never a role to, to tell your child, son, daughter, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the job we did. I'm proud of the, of the missions trip we went on and the work that was done there. I think that's appropriate and good if the pride is not in yourself and your own abilities, if it again is directed to God and how he worked through that. Jesus words should help us understand this perspective concerning pride and humility. He says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Isn't that just topsy-turvy from the way the world thinks? From the way the world thinks about pride and humility and so forth? But I think we all have an intuitive understanding of what Jesus is saying here, and that, that this, just should ha this is how it should be. How many of you guys have known someone and they're a man or a woman that's just prideful. They're just arrogant. And you don't have to be around them very long, and it just kind of oozes from them. And you kind of think in your mind, man, they just need to be taken down a notch, right? I think we've all experienced that in some way or another. Or you've been around someone that's just really humble. They have a humble spirit. And then they, maybe they desire to serve and that type of thing. And there's just something that about them that just draws you. There's something about their humility, the way that they desire to serve, the way that they are looking to others and not themselves, that you desire to exalt, right? That you desire to praise and, and honor this person for. My grandmother, who I told you she's in the, the hospital, she went in Monday night. She had hip replacement surgery last week. There were some complications. She had to go back to the ER Monday night. And the, the gentleman who... Young, young guy, probably early 20s, who is the one who came out to the car to help her to get into a wheelchair, to wheel her in. Uh, and uh, so he wheeled her in. And my grandfather, who's 94, he doesn't move very fast either. And so he's pushing my grandmother, but he's waiting for my grandfather. He's not getting ahead. He's not rushing. He's waiting. And grandmother just talked about how, how his desire to, to serve them well in that moment that's a humble spirit. That's someone who was looking out for others, who wasn't looking out for himself. And I had the great honor of meeting him, very briefly. But grandma, grandmother had been there, granny is what I call her, granny. She had been there for a couple of days in the hospital. And so Renee and the girls and I went down and we're sitting there with granny. And about that time, this orderly comes in, this young man that had helped my grandmother. And he was about to go on shift. And he just wanted to come up and see how she was doing. That's a spirit of humility. That's someone who's looking out for others and not putting themselves first. That's just a simple example. But I think it's an example that, again, here's a young man. I had instant respect for this young man. Instant respect for not only the way he treated my grandparents, but the fact that he was there wanting to know how she's doing and caring for her. That's humble. That's a humble person. And again, those type of people we desire to speak favorably of. We desire to recount their stories, right? 
how we saw them serving and loving and those types of things. I think Ezekiel 21, 26 really confirms this, this inclination in us, the way we think about the haughty and the proud and the humble. Exalt that which is low and bring low that which is exalted. That's what Ezekiel says. And again, I think it confirms this, just, this natural inclination within us. When we see someone proud and haughty, we want to see them brought down a notch. When we see someone that's humble and serves and loves, we want to lift them up. The proud need humility. And the humble are acknowledged for their humility. So the bottom line is this. Humility is a good thing, isn't it? Something that we should pursue. But biblical humanity, humility rather, begins with fear of the Lord. It's a deep reverence for God. We talked about fear of the Lord maybe a couple, two or three weeks ago. And what fear of the Lord is, it certainly is a deep reverence. But it's also tinged with this bit of true fear of God. Understanding how holy and righteous He is and how far we miss the mark. Proverbs 22.4, again, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor in life. The world says the reason people aren't successful in life is because they think too lowly of themselves. Right? We hear this. That's, that's why you can go to the Barnes and & Noble and you can go and there's two, three, four, not just bookshelves, but entire sections of books about self-help, about self-esteem, about feeling better about yourself and, and all of those types of things. Now, there's some truth to the fact that we do need to have a positive view. We need to be able to think well about who we are and that type of thing. And what do I mean by that? Since we've been a part of redemptive compassion in different ways, we've been learning more about the cycles of poverty that people can be in, the cycles of addiction that people can be in, the cycles of abuse that people can be in, all of those types of things. And certainly, there is a mentality there that has to be broke through. There's a certain way that they view themselves that really needs to be broken through. And so I love the fact that redemptive compassion, for those that are not believers, they start with, listen, you were Create in the image of God. And they move them toward understanding who Christ is and, and, and accepting Christ and ultimately finding their identity in Him. For those that are believers that are in these cycles, they help them to understand, listen, your circumstances are not who you are. Your poverty is not who you are. Your abuse that you've been going through is not who you are. Your identity is in Christ. And so they try to help them to break through these things. So please don't help me say there's not something to that. There is something powerful about that. But the, sec- the way the secular world looks at it, listen, to succeed in life, all you need to have is a positive attitude. All you need to ha- do is have self-esteem and just, just uphold yourself as, as being valuable and good and, and all of these types of things, and you're going to be fine. You're going you're gonna to lead a wonderful, successful life. But Lauren Slater has something very different to say about that. She, had a, she wrote an article for the New York Times. It was called The Trouble with Self-Esteem. And she says, the fact is, we've put antisocial men through every self-esteem test we have. And there's no evidence for the old psychodynamic concept that they secretly feel bad about themselves. These men are racist and, or violent because they don't feel, feel, feel bad enough about themselves. Isn't that amazing? These men are racist or violent because they don't feel bad enough about themselves. Now what we would say is, she wouldn't say this, I don't know where she's coming from spiritually, but they do not have a sense of fear of a righteous God. They do not have a sense of fear for this God that they will stand before one day and be judged. They are the center of their universe. It's all about them. Self-interest, self-esteem, and not Christ's interest and not esteeming Christ, they do not feel bad enough about themselves. But we can kind of look at those in prison and have a particular opinion and so forth, but brothers and sisters, let us not kid ourselves. We oftentimes do the same thing, right? We oftentimes put our own self-interest 
ahead of others. In this particular interest, their self-interest over others oftentimes led to the death of another or the, the robbery of another in any number of things. But we do it. Unbridled self-esteem leads to unbridled self-interest. That's what we see in the case of the, of the people that Lauren Slater has talked about. And it's the exact opposite of humility. But we can have unbridled self-interest as well. But there's hope for us, isn't there? We're not victims where, where there's no hope that we can break this grip of self-interest that we, can, that we can not break this grip of always lifting up ourselves over other people. No, 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 no. We have the perfect example of Christ, and we're going to be looking at that in a moment, and what he did and how he humbled himself. But I think we can. We need to pursue lives where we see the grip of self-interest giving way to Christ's interest. That's the way we do it. That's the way we start breaking this grip over self-interest for ourselves as we start to look to Christ. We lift our eyes to Him. We look to His example and what He has done, our self-esteem making way for Christ's esteem. Does that make sense? That's when we know the idol of self is, is starting to lose its grip and we are becoming more conformed to the image of Christ. I love this quote by Ray Ortland. It's a little, little long, but, but please listen to it. If, but if we are humble at all, we have to wonder, am I humble enough? Do I fear the Lord enough? Look at my lust for being noticed, my self-pity, my melodramatic internal narrative, my grasping and clinging and calculating. If only I did fear the Lord. But, there, but here is the good news. We do not come to Christ because we are humble. We come to Christ because we are proud. And he receives us and loves us and helps us in our pride. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But the grace of the Lord is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. Jesus said in his parable of the wedding feast, See, I have prepared my dinner and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. He did not say, we are ready. He said, the feast is ready. So come. Don't worry if you are humble enough. You're not, and neither am I. But all of us can go to Christ right now and moment by moment because he promises everyone who comes to him riches and honor and life. Let your heart be melted by the grace of Christ. That is humility. All the humility you need to come into the feast. So our humility starts with Christ, doesn't it? Our humility starts with understanding who we are and what he has accomplished on our behalf, knowing that in and of ourselves, we are not worthy of coming to the feast. But it's not about us being worthy in and of ourselves. It's about Christ's worthiness that has now been given to us. His worthiness, his righteousness is now our worthiness and our righteousness. Brothers and sisters, understand that. And as you understand that, understand why he is worthy because of what he has accomplished. His, his sinlessness, the life that he lived for us, his humility in going to the cross on our behalf. God himself being nailed to the cross. I love what he says here. Let your heart be melted by the grace of God. That is humility. When's the last time your heart was melted by the grace of God? When's the last time you really thought about God's grace in your life and what he has done on your behalf? If it's been a long time, that might be a pretty good indicator of where you are as far as humility and pride and so forth. Because brothers and sisters, one of the best ways to stay humble is to continually think about the cross is to think about what had to happen for me, for you, so that we could be forgiven. Thinking about the cross melts our hearts, helping us to be more humble. According to Proverbs, why does humility matter? Humility sets a course for our lives as followers of Christ. What do I mean by that? Lucy, I'm going to ask if you'll keep these next verses, a couple of verses I'm going to read up for just a couple of minutes. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, proud, but humility comes before honor. 
One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. What I'm about to say may sound very strange to you, but just stick with me for a moment, and I think you'll see why I'm saying what I'm saying. These two verses summarize, really, the message of the Bible. These two verses summarize the message of the Bible. Why am I saying that? What do I, what do I mean by that? Simply this. Humility before honor. Or another way to say it is the cross before the crown. Humility before honor and the cross before the crown. I'm not talking about just Christ and the cross that he was on and now he wears the crown, but the cross that we must bear every single day to ultimately receive the glory that we are going to receive as well. Humility before honor, the cross before the crown. Think about these two Think about those who never learn this, right? Those who never learn humility, never learn what it means to humble themselves underneath the authority of someone else. We all know these people, right? We know these types of people. Those that that, that never humble themselves to their parents' authority or never humble themselves to the authority of the teachers in school, never did their homework because they weren't going to do what anyone told them to do, never did their homework, never turned in their test, all of those types of things. Why? Because they're proud. And no one was going to have authority over them. We know these people because they go from job to job to job. Why? Because they don't like the, the fact that this person was telling them what to do. And they can only take it so long, so they go on and they find something else. We've all seen these types of people in life. They never experience, they they never humble themselves. And so in some ways, they never experience the rewards that come with humble submission. They never come with with a reward. They never experience the reward of of going through school and and getting good grades because they did what they were supposed to do. They obeyed the teacher. They didn't experience the reward of of good relationship with parents and everything that that brings because they bucked under the authority of their parents. They didn't experience, they don't experience the reward of working for other people and everything that can come with that, a good secure job and, 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 and paycheck and all of those types of things, right? Because they buck the authority that was over them. Now again, please don't hear me painting with too broad of a brushstroke, but I've seen this in my own life. I've witnessed this myself, and I'm sure that you have as well. Those who think they can take shortcuts don't understand that this is how God has set up reality, right? God's economy for how things work in this world that he created. We learn about humility as we're growing up, and we learn about submitting to authority when we are young to be able to more fully submit to our Heavenly Father. Jesus' life is the perfect example of this, right? We read in Peter, he says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the what? The sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Why did he suffer? Because he humbled himself. Philippians 2, 8 through 11, we know these, and being found in human form, he, what? Humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedient to the plan of the Father, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so because he was humble and because he did what the Father called him and asked him to do and he knew needed to be done, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility, honor, the cross, the crown. We, we may tend to think of this in big terms of Jesus and what he did, but it's true for us, right? We are called to lives of humility, of being humble, so that ultimately one day we will receive praise and honor and glory, but it will not be from the world. It will be from the one that really matters, our Father. 
1 Peter 3 through 7, 1, 3 through 7 tells us this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is what? Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you, excuse me, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Our faith, if we live humbly submitted to the Father, if we live lives of humility, it will ultimately lead to praise and glory and honor. How glorious is this? How glorious is this that as we live lives of biblical humility with an earnest desire to live by faith for the glory of God, humbly submitted to His Lordship over the course of our lives, not pursuing the things of this world that it promises will bring us fame and fortune. Instead, we keep our eyes fixed on Him, and in the end, when this world has passed away and all things become new, we will receive Praise, glory, and honor, again, from the one who truly matters, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, God does not want us to live mediocre lives, so please don't hear me saying this. Fearful to stretch and pursue and accomplish. I think He does. I think He wants us to set goals. I think He wants us to pursue great things. But again, it's not for us. It's not for our glory. It's for Him. I think there's no, I don't think there's a, uh, there's any kind of conflict here whatsoever as long as we keep our hearts right. It's something that King Nebuchadnezzar did not do. He was lifted up, right? He was, he was given great power. God is the one that put uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in his place. He gave him great, great power. Glory and majesty is what Daniel says. And the Bible does not speak negatively of this kind of power until... Until we read in Daniel 5.20, but when his, meaning King Nebuchadnezzar's heart, was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly. So that he dealt proudly. He was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. Whatever we do, brothers and sisters, we do it for him. For his glory, knowing that in the end we will all be spectacularly glorious if we humble ourselves now. We know this, that God's humility does not come naturally, right? We oftentimes don't see our own pride in Proverbs, of course, speaks to, that, speaks to that, doesn't it? All the ways of a man are right in his own eyes. It's so easy for us to not see our own pride to not see the words that we say or the things that we do as being born out of pride because everything that we do is right in our own eyes. So we need God, not ourselves to help, to point out, to bring our pride to our attention. God's Spirit is ready, willing, and able to do this, right? He is. If we go before the Lord and pray, Lord, I know that I'm a prideful person and I know that I oftentimes don't see it in myself, and I, I don't recognize it in myself. But what I'm doing is I'm coming before you and I am asking you to help me to live a life of humility. Bring me low before you, I pray. Please help me in my thought life, in the words that I speak, in my, in my actions. Help me to be a person of humility. Do you think that's a prayer that God wants to hear? You better believe it. That is music to his ears when his sons or his daughters come before him and say, please help me to be humble. That is like a sweet aroma to his ears and to his nose. So we go before him and we pray, Lord, help us. He will never, ever refuse to answer that prayer. But then how does humility set a course for our own lives? How does humility help us to navigate this life? And I think, again, Proverbs helps us. 
Proverbs 13, 13 says, Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The next one is 15, 31. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. I want you to look at, at, at four different words that are contained in here that I think will help us. As we live this life, to, to try to, to be humble, to not think too highly of ourselves. And the first one is revere. But he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. Whoever reveres the word of God, whoever understands that it's God's word that is going to help me to live a life of humility, to live a life of faithfulness, not my own wisdom, not my own strength, not by my own power, not by my own stratagems and, and, and plans that I make, but based upon God's word, that's what's going to help me to live a life of humility and live a well-lived life before him. So we must revere God's word. We must believe that his word has something to say to me. And yeah, 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 no, I know it's a good word. I know there's good, good stuff in there. And, and, and people need that. But yeah, I'm good. No, no, no. We must revere God's word. We must believe deeply that his word is for me. I must live it. I must learn it. I must know it so that I can live this word. It's going to help me to live a life of humility. And then secondly, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. So you listen. You not only revere the word, listen to the word, live out the word, but you listen as well, right? Right? It's, it's, it's good to listen. It's good to listen to sermons. It's good to listen to biblical teachings. That's good. But it's also to listen, good to listen to the words of the wise. Godly people that are in your life that speak truth to you. But to do that, you have to have a teachable spirit. Brothers and sisters, we can never have an attitude, and oh, I've got this, I know it. I'm good. I've got it all figured out. That's a life of folly. It's a life of foolishness. It's also a life of arrogance and pride. We must be willing to listen to the, li to the words of the wisdom of those who are in our lives, who care for us deeply, and who want the best for us. We must listen to life-giving reproof. And then the third one, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who what? Confesses and forsakes them, will obtain mercy. Brothers and sisters, we have to be very open about all of our sins, right? We must confess all of our sins, whatever they may be. But specifically today, we must be very quick to confess the sin of pride in our own life. However it may manifest itself, we must be very quick to confess it. Sin is, uh, pride is so deceitful, isn't it? It's so insidious. But we need to check our motives for that, why we say the things that we say, why we do the things that we do. And when we realize that we have just sinned in pride and arrogance and a haughty spirit, a haughty eye, haughty thought, whatever it may be, we need to be very quick, quick to confess and forsake. Lord Jesus, help me. I don't want to think like this anymore. I don't want to speak like this anymore. Help me to be humble. Teach me. Help me to forsake the sin of pride. Revere, listen, confess, and forsake. Jonathan Edwards, I love this. We're going to end with this quote. I love what he says here. Certainly we can sin. The, the, the pride of sin can happen in a lot of different ways. I, I was talking to a guy who works with the homeless a lot, and, and he, said, he said that even the homeless are pride, prideful. They will be proud because they have a really big box to sleep in and the guy beside them has a really small box. And so they're proud of their big box. We were talking about homelessness and pride and that type of thing. He said, Todd, I don't care how little you have, you're always going to be prideful. It is just the condition, the human condition that we are in because of our fallenness. But I think oftentimes spiritual pride can be a big part of our lives as followers of Jesus, can it? Oh, I've got it together. I've got my ducks in a row. I had my quiet time the more this morning. I had, I had time in the Word. I had my prayer time. I even fasted last week. Boy, look at them. They're struggling. They, I am so far ahead of them spiritually. 
And we're not going to say that. But boy, we oftentimes think it. It might just be a passing thought. But we oftentimes do it. Spiritual pride is something that we all deal with. We all struggle with. In one form or another. You may think that you're just barely down the road and you know how far you have to go, but you still see someone back a little ways and you're still a little prideful, a little farther ahead. Jonathan Edwards has these thoughts, and we're going to end with these thoughts. And You know, I'm going to go ahead and ask the praise and worship team to come forward while I'm reading these. And then I'm going to ask Renee to, to pray, play for just a moment. But this is what Jonathan Edwards said. He says, spiritual pride tends to speak of other person's sins, sins with bitterness or with laughter and an air of contempt. But pure Christian humility rather tends either to be silent about these problems or to speak of them with grief and pity. Spiritual pride is very apt to suspect others. But a humble Christian is most guarded about himself. He is as suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. The proud person is apt to find fault with other believers that they are low in grace and to be quick to note their deficiencies. But the humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart and is so concerned about it that he is not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. He is apt to esteem others better than himself. Brothers and sisters, what I'm going to ask us to do now as Renee prays, uh, as Renee plays, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you, let's just bow our heads and go before the Lord.